Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, attending my talk. It's my first talk at the PyData, and I'm really happy to be here to talk about accelerating Python analytics by in database processing. Um, in other words, I'm going to describe a way um, that you can use uh, to um, speed up your Python analytics by using database operations and uh, database engines. So let me first start with a, a few words about me. Uh, I come from France, from Paris. Uh, I have a Master of Engineering from SC Paris. And uh, I am also uh, currently a graduate student at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Computer Science. And I'm mostly interested in um, machine learning and cloud computing. And I've been a working student at IBM for more than one year now. Uh, I'm based in the lab, in the IBM Research and Development Lab in Böblingen, near Stuttgart where I did also my master thesis, and uh, I've been developing Python tools for in-database analytics. So I'd like first to introduce the outline of this talk. Uh, we will start with a few motivation. I will just briefly refer to um, the Python ecosystem for data science, but we will also speak about uh, the limitation and uh, the solution that you can have to cope with those. Then I will describe how we can bring analytics to the data, and um, I will introduce IBM-DB, uh, which is um, a cloud-based database that we have at IBM on IBM Bluemix. And then I will speak about Python and SQL and how we can uh, take the advantage of both of them. Then I will speak about IBM DBPy, which is um, the prototype I'm mainly presenting here. It is an open source Python package, and uh, we use it um, to um, to speed up analytics um, in uh, IBM DashDB using Python. And then uh, I will do a demo, and hopefully we have some time for questions and discussion about it. So first, the motivation. Uh, as you all know, the Python ecosystem is very rich for performing uh, data science. Um, there are a lot of packages that are used. Maybe the most famous could be NumPy, Pandas, uh, scikit-learn for the machine learning, matplotlib for visualization. Uh, there are a lot of options. And also, you can use I, IPython notebook. I also personally think uh, there are an awesome way to format your code and to uh, present insight. Um, for example, this presentation is in an IPython notebook. And the problem is that uh, there are a lot of limitations also with this uh, ecosystem. Uh, Firstly, when you use it in, in your laptop or your workstation, uh, you are limited by the um, speed of your CPUs, the number of cores you have, and the amount of RAM. And um, typically, it is very difficult to deal with data that do not fit in your main memory. So uh, if you have um, a certain quantity of RAM in general, it's really difficult to uh, deal with data that do not fit in your RAM. And another limitation is that uh, when you do that, you need to have the data locally. It has to be in your uh, computer, and this means it has to be extracted beforehand. So you need to take it from the database, put it in your computers, and um, this is nearly impossible, especially if you're working on big quantity of data. And you have several solutions to do that. And uh, I was uh, really delighted about uh, the keynote of Olivier today in the morning because uh, he was speaking about uh, those solutions. And um, I'd like to call it out of core solution because uh, out of core uh, means that um, when your data doesn't fit in the main memory, and we can distinguish between three types of solution. The first one is um, the first one is um, to perform in workstation computation. I would say that, for example, that's what you can achieve with Dask. Um, you have the ability to make data mining algorithms running in secondary memory, via, like hard drive or SSD. And then you kind of um, alleviate the problem of the um, limited amount of RAM. But on the other hand, you still have to extract the data anyway. A second way um, that I call in-cluster computation is simply to use a cluster, so to distribute uh, the computation on multiple machines in a, in a network, uh, for example, Hadoop or Spark. And um, last but not least, another solution, which is in-database computation. And that's on this, uh, this one we are going to focus in this talk. And here, the idea is to bring directly the computation to the database. So we will use uh, the database engine to perform computation, and this in so the most efficient way, just without having to extract data. 
And exactly in database computation has a lot, a lot of uh, advantages. And uh, here are a few of them. Uh, first, uh, databases are in general the backbone of all multi-tier uh, architectures. They are just basically everywhere, so uh, why shouldn't we already use them for performing more than what they actually do? And uh, they have the advantage of being uh, efficient and scalable. Um, they, have, they are very good at storing data, retrieving data, and uh, they can typically scale up to a big quantity of data in storage. And when you're performing your analytics directly in the database, you, are, you have the um, advantage of data freshness that you're sure that you're actually working on the most recent version of your data, that your data is not outdated. And another advantage is that you actually avoid security concerns, um, especially if uh, your database uh, contains, let's say, um, customer-related uh, information, such as maybe credit card numbers, or maybe it contains business critical information, then you don't, just don't, don't need to extract it from the database and you just leave it here and bring the computation there instead. And um, so I want just to introduce um, IBM DashDB. Uh, IBM DashDB is a cloud-based data warehousing system that is available on IBM Bluemix and it is optimized for data analytics and data mining. It is based on DB2 technology and integrates Blue. Uh, that is to say, it has the ability to, um, to, to have like very efficient data compression to, to reduce the, amount, the quantity of data. It can also perform uh, in-memory column store uh, operation by just uh, aggregating directly on it and decide if it can put it in memory or not automatically. And it can scale out up to um, a var um, very big uh, number of nodes as much as you want. Uh, using massive parallel processing. And so that's the kind of situation in which you are after. Um, you have people that want to use uh, the database for performing analytics, so they will access um, custom-made uh, SQL uh, queries and run them. And um, actually, I'd like to, to ask you, I'd like to ask the audience, uh, who can identify to this situation? Can you, can you show hands if you're mostly performing analytics, sometimes using just SQL, you perform analytics. Yeah, so a few of them. And um, it is actually uh, pretty uh, impractical. And since I see that we have so SQL nerds here, I'd like to, to give you a task. And the task is to compute the mean for each column given the class in the Irish dataset. So I assume you all know the Irish dataset and you all know SQL. It's actually pretty easy. The, six, the query looks like this, <laughs> just a select a range on the columns and from Iris and you group by. So, okay, SQL is not that difficult, but still, if we compare with Python, it will be just only one line. So let me just execute that. Oops, yeah. And it's just one line. You can do it in one line. And it's, it's much, much more convenient and much easier. So there is like, it looks like here there is something missing. And um, you can use something like um, that uh, Olivier introduced uh, today in the morning um, that I found very interesting, Blaze, the Blaze ecosystem, um, which is an ecosystem which provides a um, panda-like interface for multiple backends. And um, it just basically translates your Python code into something else, like SQL, if it's a database. And it has support for a lot of backends. So on the one side, it's an advantage. But uh, on the other side, I would say it is a disadvantage because it only supports um, a very narrow uh, number of functions for each backend and doesn't have the flexibility to accommodate to backends that provide extra functionality, like um, in database data mining algorithms. And so we will need something like this a kind of interface to which we could speak Python, we would translate it into SQL, do the processing in the database, and then retrieve data to map it back into some uh, Python object, like maybe a data frame or um, <coughs> NumPy series, um, something that you know already. And this, we like to call it the SQL pushdown approach, because what we do is that we translate higher level syntax into SQL, and then we push them to the underlying database. And as a user, this has the nice advantage that you don't have to, to care about 
um, the SQL that got produced because it was produced just for you. And uh, you never have to touch SQL. And I wanted to show you also this pool uh, that I found interesting, it was done by KD Nuggets. And um, this shows you the top analytics data mining uh, software used in 2015. And uh, I wanted to highlight you those two, free, two, two, uh, those two languages here. You see that uh, almost on the top, and um, Python and SQL. And how I interpret it personally is that um, I believe um, people use Python because they really like uh, the sleek and very neat syntax. It's very easy to perform um, multiple uh, queries and multiple aggregation in any, any order you want. But they are, they are forced to use SQL because they want to do such operations on big quantity of data. And typically, they are limited by Python. So it looks like there is a need to, to bridge the gap between uh, Python analytics and um, in database processing. And that's why we introduced uh, IBM DBPy. Um, that's just um, an open source, uh, open source Python package. Uh, that provides a, a panda-like syntax for IBM DB, IBM DB2 also, and it is compatible from Python 2.7 up to 3.5, and you can connect with it using ODBC or JDBC, so it is uh, basically cross-platform, which is, I think, a nice advantage, and it gives you a set of functions for performing data analytics and um, database administration at the same time. So this is the big picture, uh, basically what, how it works, that you have your users, and uh, he has simply Python installed on his uh, laptop workstation whatsoever, and uh, with IBM DBPy, and it can issue simple um, Python commands. For example, the first one is for uh, connecting to the database. Here I just connect to a database named dash tp, and then call the function called show tables, which uh, simply just return what are the tables that are available in the database. And what happened here is that at this point, SQL got uh, generated and pushed to the database via um, uh, ODBC, JDBC. Then what is returned back here is some raw data, like a set of tuples, and everything is mapped back in some um, data frame object. And now I want to do a demo with uh, this tool to show you a little bit, um, to give you a feeling what is possible with this thing. Um, it's more, uh, I'll say it's more prototype now, so it's, uh, it's just meant for, for fun and for uh, playing around with the database, but it could be um, a real robust um, product, I think. So here in the first step, um, I'm going to, I'm connecting to the database. Um, for this, we use an object that we call the IDA database. There are an abstraction layer for, for the database. And here I connect to a database that is called DashDB, and I already have all the settings. Uh, you're not seeing any password here because I have all the settings in my ODBC setting. And um, interestingly, I activate the variables to true, uh, so that I'm going to show you the SQL requests I got uh, generated when I do the next queries. And with this um, type of object, IDA database, you can perform database uh, administration. So have a look at what you have, what kind of object models you have already in the database. And uh, in also, I think interestingly, you can upload Python data frame to your database and on the other way around, download some table uh, locally if it's not too big, of course. And uh, you can also drop tables, create you, you can do everything you want uh, in Python. And here, the second step, I'm opening a pointer to a table uh, in, my data in my database. So here you can see there are these two SQL requests got, uh, send, got pushed down to the database. And um, this object is now a pointer to the table. So, and this allow, and I think that's an interesting thing, is that you can do uh, non-destructive, what I call non-destructive data manipulation. That is to say, you can virtually modify this data frame by adding columns that are aggregation of other columns, etc., but actually without altering at all the table. So you can also perform on the top of that statistics, filtering, sorting, and um, in the future there will be, of course, uh, many more uh, functions, I believe. And thus everything in a panda-like syntax. So I'm going to give you a first example, which is, I think, the, the easiest. Yeah, as you just see here, I actually I didn't explain, but I opened a pointer to the iris data frame, which is already loaded in uh, iris table, which is already loaded in my database. 
So here I'm going to um, ask for the head of Iris. And OK, so you can just see, just return me the first uh, record of the table. So that's just a kind of uh, very basic things you can do. But I think there are more uh, interesting things. For example, the computation of the correlation matrix, this kind of thing that can be uh, very computationally uh, expensive. And um, so you can see that just executing this very small line of code, I'm able to, to retrieve um, the correlation matrix just as I would do with Python. But instead, I didn't have to write all those things. Maybe I should put it higher so that everybody can see. And I think this one is also interesting because it's performing various um, aggregation on each column. And uh, this is typically here interesting to see how much SQL got uh, generated for us that we didn't have to write. And uh, in the end, we have the result. So I think it's kind of uh, interesting things because in this case, uh, the table is very small. Of course, it's an Iris data set. It has only 150 rows. Um, but it could be um, arbitrarily big. And you can do some uh, a bit more advanced things, like feature engineering, um, data manipulation, I would say. Here, for example, I just select three columns. Here, I create a column that I, I call new, and which will be the addition of one column plus the mean of another column. And so, OK, it's just done. And now I can visualize the result if I want with head, for example. And here. You can see we have the results. So this new column was created by doing the sum of the simple length plus the mean of the simple width. And you can see here, if, you, if it's not too small, uh, you can see the corresponding SQL request, simple length plus um, this, I guess, it's a, it's a mean of the uh, simple width, actually. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, that's uh, exactly uh, the thing. I'm working directly on the data, and uh, that was exactly the point of this um, slide. Um, is you, you can see, for example, let's say I, I call Iris. I just have the object. Uh, it's just a pointer. The data is not in my um, local computer, I would say. Uh, however, I can call the print function. But I think it is interesting. Just return me a SQL request that correspond to uh, the view that I have of the table I'm currently manipulating. So for um, SQL nerds, it's interesting. And uh, you can do more than that, especially because uh, we have other things that are available in the database, uh, such as machine learning algorithms that are able to run directly in the database. And um, what we want to do is that we want to provide wrappers for them so that you can use them. And um, so, as I said, there is uh, in database uh, algorithms. And for example, now with IBM DPI, you can uh, use, you can run k-means, uh, naive base, association rules. But there are more already uh, in the database, and we don't. We will provide a wrapper in the future. Uh, there's, for example, linear regression. There is decision trees. So you can do all those things. And uh, the idea is to uh, map them in a scikit-learn-like syntax because people are used to this syntax. So here I'm just calling from the IBM DPI uh, learn submodel, k-means, and I initialize the k-means um, clustering with three, three clusters. And um, okay, I'm just reopening my, my pointer to the data frame, uh, to the table, so I reopen my idea data frame. And uh, now I'm going to uh, do, like if I was with scikit-learn, uh, I'm going to fit and predict on the Iris data set. And as you can see here, um, we are calling um, a specific in-database function, which is called IDAX k-means. And it just passed all the parameter for us. We don't have to care about it. And now we're calling the predict k-means. And here is the result. So you can see that for each line, we have a prediction that has been, uh, not a prediction, but because it's, uh, unsuper it's unsupervised learning, but uh, a cluster that has been assigned. For example, for the line number one, we had a cluster, it's assigned to cluster ID1, and it is at uh, this distance, zero point, the data, data pointed at this distance, and etc. So we can do directly uh, data mining algorithms without having to download uh, anything or to use a cluster. And here, um, yeah, it's just the following of the k means clustering. I can return the description of the cluster. So we just found uh, three clusters. 
and with uh, those means. And uh, yeah, that's, I think, pretty much interesting. And I wanted to, to give you a sneak preview about what I've been doing more recently. Um, I've been, as I said, uh, doing my master thesis at IBM also, and um, I work, uh, I've been working on an extension of IBM DBPy uh, where um, I enable uh, in database feature selection. That is to say, um, I try to enable uh, the estimation of the um, est interact in, yeah, and the quality of features for doing a prediction. And there are many ways to do that. One of the ways is, for example, to compute the information gain. Um, I don't know if I want to, to, to explain that now, but um, um, yeah, information gain is also called mutual information, and it's just a quantity that tells you um, the amount of information that is shared by two variables. And we can use that to get an estimation of um, how interesting is an attribute for predicting another one. So I'm just opening again the Iris data set, and I, I'm calling my info gain function. And here you can see those, uh, all the SQL that got generated, and in the end, I have an information gain matrix that is returned. I put missing value on the diagonals because it's not interesting to uh, predict the information gain of a variable with itself. It would be necessarily maximal. So here, basically, you can see all those SQL things. Uh, SQL requests were just uh, generated to compute various entropy measure that we use to do, uh, to, we use to compute the information gain. And now I want to give you uh, just a small performance comparison of how would have it been if I wanted to do those kind of thing uh, directly in this computer, in my notebook, and if I was doing it uh, on the other side with um, IBM dash DB entry plan on Bluemix, so that's typically what you, you can get for free uh, on IBM Bluemix. And uh, so just the spec of my uh, computer, it has just an Intel Core 5, uh, 2.6 gigahertz and 16 gigabyte RAM. So it's just a standard, uh, I would say, standard configuration. And um, here is the plot for the covariance metrics. So just computing the covariance metrics. Uh, here there's a number of rows. So what we do is that we take the same uh, data frame, um, same table, and we make it scale. And here is the number of uh, seconds the queries took to, to execution to compute the matrix. In blue, you have the in-database runtime, and in red, you have uh, in-memory runtime. I'm sorry, it's a bit small, so I, I, I say it. And um, so you can see that uh, the in-database runtime run, uh, I mean, scales much better than the in-memory runtime. And this is what actually um, we take we measured only the pure um, computation. Not we didn't take into account the time needed to download the data at first. Also, and it would be much much bigger otherwise. Also, when you use Panda, when you open a data frame, it uh, depending on the size of the data frame, it can take a long time too. And I think a point that is particularly um, interesting here is this point here, because you can see that. Uh, from um, this point, uh, the in-database uh, runtime becomes uh, more interesting than the in-memory uh, runtime. And it's about, actually, here it's about half a million rows. So when you have a data frame that is bigger than half a million rows, it's uh, more interesting to use in-database runtime than in-memory. But if you're working on very small data, then um, it's better to do it locally. I don't know why. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> it was, I wanted to show another plot. Oh yeah, there is another plot after. Okay, and this plot is uh, for the pivot table function. Um, if you don't know it, it's just a function in Panda that computes some aggregation based on, um, on the value of the columns. And uh, here we just count the occurrence for each class. And um, so you can see that here again, the in-database runtime does scale better. But uh, I think the most interesting here is this point. And what happened here actually is that I had an out-of-core, um, uh, I mean, out-of-memory error in my uh, laptop. And uh, that means that from this point, which is um, a data frame that had um, 18, 18 million rows, I wasn't able to process it anywhere, uh, anyway in my uh, local computer. So I, I just put it this plot because I found it funny that it was, it was not possible anymore to, to do the experiment. And for the deployment of this um, 
this Python package, it is already available on PyPI, so you can give it a try if you want. Uh, pip install IBM DFI, and um, we have it on GitHub, and it is under the BSD license uh, under the IBM DB analytics groups. And for future work, um, as I said, it is really a prototype for now. Uh, what we want to provide is that we want to provide a full test coverage. We already have a basic test coverage, but uh, we cannot guarantee uh, the absence of bugs, of course. And uh, there will be more features coming soon, uh, such as the ability to uh, compute uh, things from different tables, because um, one of the typical uh, use cases of the um, typical schemas that are used in uh, data base and data warehouses is that star schema. So you have um, your uh, data that is split around uh, various tables, and you need to join them or merge them before. So that we want to, to enable it with IBM DPI. Maybe what would be interesting is to have some a function for retrieving uh, samples of the data in a, in a clever way, maybe certified sample or something like this. And uh, we want to provide more machine learning wrappers. As I said, um, there are more algorithms that are already available. And uh, we will integrate soon the work I've, I've been doing in feature selection. And I have a few colleagues uh, working on um, in database geospatial analytics. So uh, now I'm going to uh, go for the conclusion. Um, IBM DBPy uh, is an interface for uh, in-database computing, and it relies on just on the database engine. So uh, what is, I think, here interesting is that it really doesn't matter um, how powerful if you're a workstation or a computer. I could do that with a very uh, minimal, very simple um, hardware, like uh, maybe a Raspberry Pi or uh, something even smaller. And um, you don't need to extract the data at all. So you're sure you're working on the most recent version of the data, and um, you avoid security concerns by, by not spreading uh, your data out of your database. And it is intuitive because we use, we mimic, I would say, we mimic the Panda and the scikit-learn syntax, and um, it shows great performance on big, I would say, big enough data sets. However, there are a few drawbacks, of course. Um, like if you're connecting to a remote instance, a database instance, um, then um, if it's not in your local network, you need to go through the internet. Uh, so you cannot, you cannot do if you are offline. And um, it is working only for IBM dash DB, IBM DB2, because of course it's a, it's a wrapper that uh, called specific function from IBM DB2, IBM dash DB. And uh, it covers, of course, only a small part of Python analytics capabilities because there are so many things you can do uh, with scikit-learn or Panda. We couldn't, uh, anyway, cover everything. And uh, yeah, if there are our users here, uh, just want to say that we have a, a similar interface for R, which is called IBM DBR. So maybe you want to check this out. And um, that's it for me. I want to thank you for your attention. And I will uh, be very happy to answer your question if you have some. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think it was a very good mix of uh, practice and the theory. All those, I really like those. Um, excuse me if I, I missed that, just the first performance chart that you showed. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just wondering why did you have these peaks and dips? Uh, That's a, a very good question. And actually, I wanted to say during the talk that I didn't know. And uh, I'd like to, somebody to explain me. Um, because I, I noticed that at the beginning, and then I told myself, okay, it's, it's normal, it's just like I'm performing a second experiment for each data point. But the truth is that here I'm performing several experiments for each point. Actually, I'm performing three, and I do the average of it. So maybe it's not enough for getting rid of the variance. Um, maybe there are another reason, I don't know. Uh, maybe if somebody can answer this question, uh, why Panda has such... Um, or is it me, or <laughs> why Panda has such a variance? I, I also asking myself. So good that you pointed out. <laughs> Thanks. It is on the covariance matrix function. So I don't know how it's the implementation of the covariance matrix function, but it would be interesting to see. Maybe depending on the 
the size of the table, there are different um, address um, assignment in the background, or I don't know. Yes, uh, actually, this is the question that I would like to, to make to you right oh. now. Where, where, uh, where are you? Here oh, I am. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, have you run this, uh, this benchmark uh, with which uh, you compare the two, the two different things of uh, running uh, Python analytics in database or not? Have you run that in a variety of different uh, data sets? Oh, uh, on, that, on different data sets, you mean? And different machine learning tasks. Yeah, um, well, it depends. Here we just focused. I, I did other um, analyses and uh, just the covariance metrics. I did others. Um, here I just selected a sample. Um, I, we could use other um, data sets. Here, actually, I'm using a data set that has 12 columns. It is a Titanic data set that maybe you, you, will, uh, you know, maybe from Kaggle. Uh, that you can download it. Uh, I assume also depending on, um, of course, it depends on the size, the number of columns. Here we have only the scalability with the number of rows. We didn't um, plot the scalability with the number of columns, but would be also interesting to, to see. But yeah, I, I tried all the plots, but uh, those were, the, I think, the most interesting one. Yes, and the second part, um, have you taken account uh, all this uh, all these different things that one has to take, to, to have in mind in order to produce an appropriate interface on a database. I mean that having only an interface, for if, since you are working with the data, you are working on the data, um, you need to keep uh, the database uh, healthy after that operation. Keep it healthy, you mean? Keep it healthy, not uh, don't distract the data. Yeah, exactly, that's uh, the idea of, um, the thing to do um, non-destructive manipulation, and uh, we basically never write anything. We do only almost only select queries. We return results, but we don't write in the table. But we do we do do some some things like uh, maybe you, you you could see it. Uh, we are creating views, but they got here. For example, here you can see I, I, we create some view here, but we automatically always drop them after. They are just temporary view. So we have to, to exactly. That's a big uh, problem, actually, that you were speaking. Um, you're more than welcome to talk to Edward. There is a coffee yeah, yeah. break you next, can, so can, let's other people. We can ask speak uh, offline if you want. I would be very happy about that. Uh, I have a question, and maybe on the database size, uh, side, do you, do you have the ability to upload uh, user-defined functions and user-defined aggregate functions? that you would write in Python or C or something else? We, we, uh, that's a very good question. Um, we could do it. Uh, maybe we will do it in the future. For now, we are not doing it. We are only um, performing uh, a range of uh, SQL queries. But we could also imagine defining uh, user-defined functions. Um, I think that's a very, uh, that's a, at some point, I asked, me, I asked myself this question also, if I, I had to do that. but. Um, for the integrity of the database, we wanted to uh, not creating functions and leave the database exactly in the state it was at the beginning. Um, so maybe we could think about how to delete them after we use them. Uh, but then that's a question when. Uh, uh, if the people just shut down the terminal, um, uh, how could we uh, clean that? But uh, that's a very interesting point. Um, so you said that this is uh, special for uh, IBM Dash DB, but uh, so to my uh, like I, uh, I this seems like normal SQL. So can you support also other backends? Yeah, actually it's possible. Um, IBM Dash DB, um, IBM DB2 has a, have a different dialect of SQL actually, um, but it's very close to uh, normal SQL. So what could happen, and um, that would be totally uh, OK, is that you can fork the code, and you can just change a little bit the queries, and then it would be work for other backends, uh, other SQL backends. Uh, but of course, for example, things that you could not uh, port uh, would be, for example, k-min clustering would be very difficult to port, uh, because you would need to have also um, in-database uh, clustering, uh, in-database k-mins. But otherwise, it's very actually very easy to uh, port. I think most of the things you can port them. For 
their authority. I just want to ask in the similar direction. If you have a, say, Postgres or Oracle or whatever database, then the only thing to do is to adapt the code mm. to for to have a yeah. regular SQL and to have the right driver, right? Exactly. The, uh, and that's you, it. Yeah, you have just to you can fork uh, the, yeah. the project, change the SQL queries, and then uh, of course you have. Um, yeah, let me show the bigger picture. I have it at the end. Um, here, there could, this could be here uh, something you have to adapt to, uh, to uh, connect with ODBC, JDBC. We support both with IBM GFI. And of course, you need to have the DB2 driver and uh, would be the same for others, yeah. But uh, basically, uh, every, every, just the only things you need to change. <laughs> so, uh, related question. So at the beginning of the presentation, you said that it's related to Blaze, but Blaze is more uh, general. It supports MongoDB and whatever. Yeah. Uh, there is also IBIS, which is more recent, yeah. and this is very focused on SQL. So it's very similar to your project. How does it compare? If you would start today, would you use IBIS instead? Or? That's a very interesting question. Actually, the IBIS project started two months after I started this project. And um, it is uh, working only for Impala. And um, yeah, 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 exactly. Postgres, Impala, and um, it is. I think it's interesting, and um, there should be some uh, possibility to uh, share some code on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I heard about it, and it's kind of uh, exactly a solution to the fact that Blaze is too general for um, platforms that um, provide enhanced uh, functions like data mining algorithms. But it's. Uh, I would say it's. Kind of the same, but uh, for another backend. Um, thank you very much, Edward, for this very interesting talk.